Okay, yeah, Kurt Larson. Uh, I've been at the Wisconsin Club going in my 14th season. Um, we are an 18 hole facility. We actually have two two properties. We have a social club downtown, and we have obviously the country club in the suburbs. Uh, we have about a about 1,100 memberships in total. 300 and change are golf memberships. Um, we just finished a season where we did. Uh, little over 19,000 rounds, which is 5,000 rounds than we did before. So um, we've been using Tag Marshall since 2015 and uh, it's been a great tool for us. So. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Um, so uh, Kurt and the team are one of the early generation Tag Marshall users because we only introduced the system to the market in 2015. So if you want to meet a pioneer, there is one. <laughs> and it's been a great uh, journey. Um, uh, obviously, we've uh, got quite a few clubs in the Wisconsin area. And uh, it's great that uh, we just keep going strong. Um, let me just jump ahead. Thanks for the intro there, Kurt. Uh, so Tag Marshall is a golf course optimization system. Uh, we have and this number is going to change rapidly again now in the coming months. We've tracked 15 million rounds of golf and we've got over 300 clubs now that we work with. Um, on this list, you can see quite a few um, well-known clubs. And yeah, I'm delighted to say that uh, a few of them have presented with us on webinars like this before. Like we've had uh, Chandler Worthington from Hazeltine. Uh, we've had Mario from Quaker Ridge. We've had... Um, two golf pros from Valhalla over the years, um, uh, uh, Baltus Roll as well, and Calusa Pines too. I, we're really um, making the rounds here, it seems. And we also have quite a few uh, daily fee clubs, some of the Wisconsin highlights there too. That's uh, Whistling Straits and Erin Hills, for instance, um, that are ahead of the game. Uh, but uh, the majority of our clubs are really the, the good club that is aspiring to do things better. Um, and uh, um, and looking to keep improving. Uh, we're also, yeah, we're a tech partner to the European Tour and we help out the USG and the RNA where we can because data is our, um, is our game and we've got a lot of it. Like, a, like I mentioned, 15 million rounds of data and sometimes those associations, when they do research, they might do so at a single club or at two clubs um, for a short uh, period of time to try and get some tracking data, for instance. But obviously we've got multi-year data, also year-on-year -year data. And that's always exciting for them to look at. Um, and we've just come off a, an exceptionally um, roller coaster type year. Uh, <laughs> um, here's some numbers. Uh, Kurt, what, what was 2020 like at uh, the Wisconsin Club? And did you shoot the lights out in terms of rounds? Um, how's it gone there for you guys? Yeah, we, our rounds were up uh, 38% for 2020, and um, member specifically, we were up 50, 54% just in member rounds itself. So, um, and for us, uh, you know, we, our governor orders, uh, we weren't able to open the course until the end of April, which we probably could have opened at least two weeks earlier, but because of orders, we weren't able to. And we also, when we did open, we had, we went about 30, 40 days of having 18 minute tea times um, because of the order to space people out. And then, then when we went another 30 days at 12 minute tea times until we got into uh, uh, middle of June, uh, end of June, we were able to go down to our normal 10 minute tea times. So uh, with us doing 19,500 rounds, I can't imagine what that would have been had we had normal tea times the whole year and open when we wanted to. And uh, we actually had to shut down for six days because of COVID as well. So um, I, I see this year being 20 plus, that's for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, you're probably about to find out what that's like with normal inventory and a, a very keen golfing community looking to get out and, and do it all over again. Um, what, does, uh, what was the lay of the land like with regards to single riding at, at the club and, and also in, in the state? Yeah, I mean, I went, part of the order in the beginning was single riding only unless it was with a family member. Um, that 
I don't want to say quickly, but eventually uh, went away. But we ran into an issue where the it became a lifestyle change for a lot of our golf members where they enjoyed having their own cart. And they weren't taking it for health reasons or safety reasons. They were just taking it because they could play faster and spread all their stuff all over the cart and listen to their own music. And uh, so we, we were running out of carts on a daily basis because of it. So um, pace of play was really not an issue last year because of single riding carts, but we're going back to uh, what we're going to make it mandatory that there is no single riding carts this year. So um, I anticipate pace of play is going to jump back into the picture for us big time. And we're going to, you know, obviously be counting on tag to help us uh, that this year. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's going to be a, a different ball game and expectations are going to have to get reset again, but also, I mean, that's how people have played for years, right? So they should yeah. remember. Um, one of the question that's, uh, questions that's come up is, um, are we going to see as much traffic again? Because obviously um, the uh, regulations are adjusting backwards a little bit and uh, vaccine rollout is going ahead uh, pretty well and so on. So, so maybe people go back to how things used to be and they might play less golf. So what we've done is looked at some 2021 data um, and the, the most reliable source here is obviously Florida, where half of your members are right now, <laughs> well, some at least. Um, and what we're finding there is that uh, there seems to be a 15% year on year, because obviously that January, February last year was pre-COVID. So that um, upwards trend uh, is definitely continuing. And, and as, you, as you're saying, that you're expecting that to flow right into the northern season now. Uh, and what a blessing as well for the game, right? Uh, but if there's lots of traffic, we, we need to manage that traffic. Um, and the expectations of uh, players certainly haven't uh, reduced. And, and, and I would imagine, and I wasn't on site obviously for that, but uh, that when, first, when golf first started out again, people must have been just so grateful to get out again, right? Um, and, and, uh, and if things weren't quite working that well, they were probably quite forgiving. But now uh, they would think, well, you've had a while now to get used to things. You had a while to get used to traffic. Give us your very best. Um, and our expectations are sky high again, as they've always been. <laughs> yes, most definitely. I mean, I want to even say that members were uh, so appreciative of of just giving them the ability to get out there. And uh, even though they're the members, they're the one paying the dues. Uh, I'm the employee, but uh, uh, they treated us like more than just an employee. They were, you know, we were, we were their entertainment for the whole summer. So pretty special uh, part of uh, being a golf pro this, this past year. At, at last you're getting what you deserve here. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. No, that's great. I mean, it, it really also came down to, well, human interactions now were something that happened less and less, right? So the ones that you do have and the ones that are positive, you really cherish them. And I'm sure that you guys at the, at the club uh, with the familiar faces and great service would have been just a highlight for, for most of your members. So, and uh, have you had uh, an, an increase in membership as well alongside that? Yes, we've... Uh... You know, we were uh, kind of struggling there for a little while. Uh, we weren't seeing much. Uh, we weren't seeing the, quite the activity in our membership. We were we we were down to maybe 285 at the start of 2020. Um, today we're at 308. I want to say is our last time I looked at the numbers. So I mean, we're we're seeing a huge increase, and in, I'd say 80 percent of that increase is members uh, 40 and under. Uh, there's, um, I'm interviewing or doing orientations with new memberships that are, I wouldn't call them country clubbers just yet. They're kind of new. They played golf a little bit, but uh, they really want to step in as they see this as a family, uh, direction to take their kids in a fun and safe environment. So it's pretty exciting to, that we're going to have a lot of kids out here this year, which is uh, great to see. That's brilliant. And, and I'm sure that, uh, in the past, you, maybe you've had, uh, strategies and campaigns to attract that very group and now they come with you i mean what more could you ask for that's well done yeah um so what we want to talk about today is obviously um, player experiences and and what's important to players and also efficiency 
uh, because obviously we all try and uh, work efficiently and, and we have to, especially if things get busy, like we're anticipating. Uh, Kurt, what I want to ask you now is one question. Um, if you're looking at your player base, also yourself as a player, um, and maybe thinking back to other clubs that you've played, uh, that you've worked at uh, over the years, what factors would you say are the top player experience um, sort of keys and highlights? What do players say is the most important to us? So, so if you were to, uh, to pick three of that list, um, cost and value, accessibility, tea time availability, can I get a round in on a Saturday when I want to, um, playing partners in a group, pace and flow of play, clubhouse and amenities, course conditioning, course design, what would you say are the top three that are the most important to players? Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer because it depends on uh, the, uh, the person's background. But as a personal side of it, obviously course design and condition are important, but, uh, you know, pace of play and flow, if I'm joining a private club, one of the main reasons I'm doing that is so that I can enjoy my round with people I want to be with and, and, uh, and not play in five hours. I want to play in a good pace and not wait every shot. And so, um, you know, those are definitely keys to uh, why our, you know, why anyone joins a private club as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Um, Derek, uh, from your side and, uh, and obviously you representing what is it now 900, uh, clubs, what, what would you think floats to the top here? I would agree with Kurt, obviously, uh, course, presentation, all that, but uh, the experience while you're there and a big part of that is the flow on the course. It's, um, it's amazing how, and when, you know, if they play slow or they perceive slow play or it is backed up, suddenly and there's a whole lot of other problems at the club that suddenly show up that uh, probably really aren't. You know, it just, you know, you know, you start your day off bad, it typically just gets worse, even if it really didn't. So uh, I, uh, I would echo what Kurt was saying there. It leads to a lot of other complaints you may never, may never would have gotten. So yeah, yeah. negativity breeds more negativity. <laughs> yeah. All, all of a sudden the beer is too warm and the service is too slow and the roughs are too long and what have you. Right. So, right. And you know, three weeks ago you forgot my bag or, you know, it just, it just, that snowball goes crazy quickly, and uh... yeah, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So the the USGA has obviously done some research uh, in this um, uh, as part of their mandate, and they found that the top experience factor is course conditioning. I mean, we all know that uh, anecdotally, and also if you look at your budget, you'd certainly know because <laughs> uh, it's normally a case of as much as possible goes into conditioning, um, which is. Uh, uh, a huge budget pool, but it's interesting how close to that in terms of percentage of players who say that's key to us, pace and flow and time it takes to play actually is. Um, and I think we need to probably differentiate between the pace, meaning how long does it take me to play at this course, but the flow is how much wait times happen out there, if any. They go hand in hand, but you might play 10 minutes over what you're expecting, but if you weren't held up, you're probably not going to worry, right? Like if it's a good flow and, and there's a bit of a different a difference between the two. Um, that's probably uh, Im important to to remember. So as far as Wisconsin Club goes, uh, they could, uh, how do you manage the pace and the field flow? And then obviously uh, um, you've paid a lot of attention to this um, for a number of years now, become excellent at it. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken that uh, Obviously, uh, that COVID year, single riding year aside, uh, you were very close to virtually guaranteeing a, a four-hour round, uh, which is a risky thing to do as a golf club. But I think you got so good at managing things that that you were confident that you could do that. Uh, um, talk us a little bit through how, uh, what uh, uh, system you use here from a tag marshal standpoint and, and how it helps you. Yeah, we... Um... You know, we've been fortunate uh, back in 2015 when I first was introduced to TAG. I, um, we had prior to that, we were the typical club trying to find a, you know, a semi retired individual, the ranger of the golf course. And, um, you know, some years I'd get a good ranger, but most years I would not. And um, so this just seemed like a logical choice of what I was going to pay a ranger for the summer or marshal for the summer. Um, 
I could I could afford tag Marshall. So we, we haven't looked back since. And um, so we have a I think we were one of the first clubs that took the walking tag that uh, that tag Marshall was providing for caddy programs. And we had it put into our golf carts. Um, I think we're on version two or three by now, but we hardwire our carts and we still have walking tags for our walking groups. And that's the huge play that tag has over any other cart tracking company because they, most of them, or I don't believe any of them have uh, the ability to also monitor your walking groups. So we're 75% riding, 25% uh, walking. So for us, to not track 25% of our activity out there just doesn't make much sense. So um, now we have a TV screen uh, right behind the golf shop counter that with tag Marshall map, the course map pulled up on the screen. And then obviously my staff all have it on their computers. And so if I'm stuck in my office, uh, I have a dual screen. I don't know if you can see it in the picture or not. I always pretty much keep tag up on one side and I'm working on the other. So with a glance, I can look over and if I see any red circles, I know that I got a group that's behind pace. I can check and see who is who it is. I can verify with the old fashioned watch just to make sure. And uh, so, uh, and then if it's an issue, I send someone out immediately to let them know. And, um, you know, we use, we use data when we confront a group. Uh, obviously we're polite. We, we apologize for interrupting them. Um, we want to let them know, make them aware that they're, you know, they're on a four hour and 20 minute pace so that, and the groups behind them are waiting. So hopefully that's enough to make them go when they realize they're going to be the over four hour group. But if not, then, then I go out there and give them a little bit more of a coaching along. And, uh, you know, so yeah, that's how we use it. it um, we, we mark every cart in the morning. So we use four T's for our tea time system. So every morning, four tees and tag communicate, and we're able to put match the tee time up with the cart number, so we know who's in each group as well. So, um, and uh, and because of the way tag works, it, it it's not the time isn't based on the tee time. The time is based on when they drive off the first tee. So we have an accurate number uh, or time of when they started. So if they tell me they started five minutes late. I'll already know that when uh, when we do talk to that group. Um, thanks, Kurt. That's a, a great um, explanation. So, so this is what this looks like, right? You've got it in on the video in the background. Um, uh, with uh, this is obviously an imaginary course. Um, I believe that our our team flipped over Aaron Hills and planted lots of trees on it. <laughs> um, which would be doing a disservice to Aaron Hills, as we know. But uh, so as far as the, uh, I mean, you can look at any course on the Tag Marshall roster now and you would know what's going on, right? Because you're so used to the system um, and it uh, it's really straightforward. So, so as far as this particular course and the imaginary traffic that's happening, what is it that you would see here? What, what do you know just looking at this at a glance? Well, um, I, you know, the colors are a touch different than, than they show up on my end. So I, I may get this wrong, but, um, you know, I see a whole five that uh, their color is telling me they're possibly 17, card 17 is behind pace. 18 is waiting on them. So they're, they're being held up by them. So, um, and then obviously I think it's 19 behind them as well. So, uh, this is, tells me that 17 is playing at a pace that is affecting other groups. Now, if they're a minute off, you know, I, 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 I'm just going to keep my eye on them. But if they're, you know, five, 10 minutes off and they're early in their round, especially if, if I'm looking at this correctly, they're on hole five. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to address this now because that 10 minutes is, I'm sure Stephen knows, uh, that 10 minutes is going to turn into 30 minutes by the time we get to the back nine. Very, very quickly. Very <laughs> quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for me, uh, I thought of this um, and that it might be a little off target here, but, you know, I, um, 
as you know, Stephen, we don't get to leave work very often. We live, eat, breathe our job. And so what's kind of neat is I'm able to look at all this on my phone um, when I'm not on property. You know, maybe it's six o'clock at night and I just want to know, hey, is there still people on the course? Where are they on the course? Or I go to one of my son's baseball games on a Saturday afternoon. I race out of here and try to catch an hour of his game. I can still look on my phone and make sure there aren't problems. Um, hoping my staff is taking care of those, but just a peace of mind that I know what's going on out there is, is extremely important. And um, whether it's pace of play or not, it just, if you had a full golf course and to really not have a, an ability to see what's going on is I think you're doing a, yourself a disservice and your members as well. I mean, you're, you're the pro, you need to know what's moving out there. And this just allows you to do it quickly and easy. Um, Kurt, maybe uh, another, uh, um, a, a little bit on the, uh, the 40s uh, integration. So uh, you know that sometimes certain members are um, notorious um, and sometimes also se they're sensitive to deal with and some people are just great and uh, they go along with whatever your assistant um, throws at them. Um, how does it help you manage uh, the characters and also if there is some um, notorious uh, slow players that might impact your field uh, throughout the season. How, how does the data help you manage that? Well, it's it's it, they're facts. That's the biggest thing. Is I have facts to when I when a member confronts me. Uh, let's say after a round, they say, "God, that was a five-hour round of golf. This is this was ridiculous. What you know? What's going on? I thought you guys were you know marsh marshaling the course, and you know." I'm sure Stephen would agree nine out of 10 times that five hours really was 440 or 430, you know, but it felt like five hours, you know, but I can back them up and say, you know, actually, you know, Mr. So-and-so, your, your, your round was slow. We're not happy with it either, but it was four and a half hours, not five. I can show you the, the, the data right here if you're interested. And, um, you know, and obviously as a pro, you already, you, you see the uh, ingredients for each foursome. You, you see a foursome and you know those four individuals and you go, that's going to equate to a slow round. And so you're hypersensitive to it. You trust TAG to give you those numbers. And, you know, if after the first hole, they're already three minutes behind, bam, you can go address it. And, um, and four T's uh, is our tee time system that we use for our making tea times. Um, and they just work, they just work so beautifully together. Uh, I don't know if we were the first club to merge those two together, but it's, it's one powerful tool, even though they're two separate uh, companies. Uh, yes, Kurt, you can claim it. And thanks for the introduction to, um, uh, to the team at, at, uh, at Fortis. They're great to work with. I know our team love working with them and they've got a great API as do, as do ours, uh, our team. So the APIs work together. We also um, integrated with Club Essentials and Jonas and the going uh, uh, tea sheets by, at this point. But I think you guys were really the first ones to say, this would be great to do. Can you make it happen? Um, and now you've got uh, uh, tons and tons of member gear data. I think one of the things that's uh, maybe worth uh, chatting to a little bit is the, the efficiency side of things, because obviously the, the pre-tag martial world for you meant that you needed somebody out there looking for gaps in the field, looking for problems, sort of trawling the course backwards, um, spending endless hours trying to manage something that's essentially unmanageable unless you can see everything, which you can't. Um, and uh, so how, how does it now work in terms of who goes out? Um, how much time do they spend on it? Um, and do you, do you uh, need to uh, set somebody aside to say, you, you uh, take a look today and you pay attention to what's happening? Um, and then you go out um, and do you still get value from these staffers in terms of, um, well, more high value things that you want them to do rather than go look for problems? What's, uh, what's the reality like for you guys now? And maybe also a question um, because Tag Marshall's got the, 
uh, your geofence alerts one, but also pace alerts that will ping your cell phone if you set it up like that. Um, so how's, how does that work from an efficiencies point of view? Because obviously you want to pay attention to it, but you don't want to waste time on it. So how, how do things run yeah. there? Well, uh, so we, uh, I'm sure like most clubs, we have a, we have a starter uh, on, uh, outside and uh, they're in charge of getting the groups to the tee and, and obviously making sure that four tees and tag have current information uh, that the carts are marked for each tee time or walking tags are put on at least one of the individuals in the walking group, uh, whether it be a caddy or a, a trolley or whatever it is. Um, you know, so now I have one person that can be watching the golf course and managing that so that my, my assistants can now work on the next coming couples event or event that's uh, on the schedule. But, um, and uh, so then when this starter identifies an issue, then he can notify me or another assistant that we have, a, we have something to handle now. But yeah, we're instead of sending an assistant out or a golf shop person out on a on the course for three four hours on a busy Saturday, um, I've got them here working on on taking care of the members or projects. So, um, and again, I'm always watching tag just because I I just love to know what's going on and where everyone is at all times. So efficiency wise, it's it's, it's crazy good. And, um, you know, you get the, that's the reason why we have it. It makes us better and uh, in every way, which way. Um, thanks. Uh, and, and I think, uh, yeah, this picture here shows um, uh, a young lady going out and having a, a pace conversation. That's actually from the, the Europe Pro Tour. But it's, it's an example that I think is quite um, telling in that in the, in the past, you needed to have a marshal with a bit of authority, you know, that, that could put a bit of pressure on people. And it often ends up being confrontational. And now it really, anyone could do this. An assistant, the friendliest person you can find can do this because they have data. And obviously that I would imagine adds much more to the player experience to have a friendly conversation rather than being chased along by a marshal, a ranger. I mean, these already are military terms, right? So you, you want to actually stay away from that. Um, do you still have the martial role as such, or is it just here's a play assistant and we are to help you? Yeah, we, um, we, we, the person I would send out there would be an assistant professional. I have three of them, so our membership knows them. So I like to send them first, uh, as I might have said earlier, and, and I've educated them on how you approach each group. And, um, but, you know, data is the key. You know, when you let them know that right now you're on a four hour and plus minute round, uh, it's pretty hard for them to argue. You know, if you're solely going on the fact that you're holding up the groups behind them, that's not always fair because that group could be playing in four hours or under four hours, but the groups behind them just happen to be faster players. So data, you know, uh, is everything. And, uh, and then and then speaking of data now, um, and this might be jumping ahead photo from where you were going, but now I can hand my golf committee facts. Mm. Um, Cause you know, you'll get, you'll have a day where someone will complain about slow play to your golf chairman or golf committee. And now I have data that I can uh, provide the committee to, to show them really what the, where the problem is or identify individuals because the system tracks individual history, so. Um, yeah, I, I just jumped ahead to that because this is, um, I know that is one of the things that we look to add to the industry is how can you utilize data more uh, to run better operations and how can you make better decisions based on, 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 on data. So, so here's, um, if you'll allow me just to talk to that for a, a couple of seconds. So the playing groups on a single day would be displayed like this. So it's a, a, a graph that goes, here's your 733. That was a very early group, 823, 829. And then, um, and then obviously it goes through. Um, you can see if it's a single, a twosome, a threesome, a foursome, you can filter by that. And then the colors show, here's a foursome having held up a few groups behind them. So, so what you can do, obviously, if you're looking back at a single day, maybe things don't work as well as you would have wanted, or you can look back at a week, or you can look back at a month, uh, you can then identify where those crunch times were, and maybe also who were the people 
um, and maybe you need to pay more attention from a staff uh, didn't get out there quickly enough. So you can keep improving. One of the things that we look at obviously is the classic average round time. That particular day, you guys play to four hours and two minutes. And I think your goal is 4.10 generally, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think it's I think it's south of 4.10. I believe it's 4.05. 405 actually. Yeah, that's what I thought it was, yeah. Yeah, um, and but what we do is uh, because obviously, obviously the average, often the morning rounds uh, run quite a bit faster than uh, the late morning. <clears throat> so the average sort of balances things out, but you really want to know what's what. So down here, we're looking at the distribution as to how many rounds were faster than goal time. That's the blue. How many rounds were on goal? That's green within 10 minutes is orange. And then there's a little bit of um, over time, but obviously it's just a fraction of the rounds in terms in terms of this day, it's one, two, three, four groups or so that went over. But what we can also show um, the whole pace by uh, so um, whole by whole pace, and within that, and that's that's new now the season. That I'm, I'm sure Kurt, you'll find that quite interesting. Um, we break down the time spent on the tee box, in the fairway, and on the green. So you can actually have if your goal time is set to be x for the t box and then you're going way over on the t box that is obviously means that this is where most of the waiting happens right so now you can actually drill down into that and you can also go chat to your superintendent and if there are holes that are um underperforming maybe there's some small tweaks that uh, that can alleviate that that might be um uh, where you set um, the hole for the day or it might be something more structural you know like we've had a club remove one tree and free up four minutes on a hole <laughs> um, and they said well like you're saying without the data we'd never have known that um, but going back to your reporting um, so how is it uh, helpful to you uh, with regards to uh, your, your committee um, uh, that that you're reporting to at the end of the season um, and again, um, I would assume that if you don't have data, if you don't have the facts, this can become very emotional quickly, especially if there's a few sensitive people uh, within that group of decision makers. And maybe they've had two or three days that they felt went bad and all of a sudden the whole club's on fire as far as they're concerned. And if you have data, um, you can have a facts-based conversation. Yeah, I mean... Um... I at this point I uh, I haven't shared. I just earned it. I just was given a golf committee in the last twelve months. So and last year with COVID and single riding carts, um, I uh, I haven't had to use data. But I starting this year I'll be able to provide every month uh, you know a report on our average pace of play uh, to my committee. But personally, I've used it when maybe I was unavailable on a day, maybe I was away from the club playing with members or, or I was, um, you know, teaching all day or in meetings all day. Um, and someone sends me an email and says, today was terrible. W what happened out there? It was very slow. I can go back and look at the data and what makes me feel like I was there and I can see the flow and I can see the report of where the problem started, which group of people it was, and then I can backtrack with my staff to find out how we addressed it and then respond to that email or that request with facts. Mm -hmm. So um, what's, uh, what's really nice that I view is, uh, um, is uh, in the past, TAG has helped me set up a report that excludes certain events. I, I don't want certain events to to give us incorrect data. You know, if I, if I have an outing on a Monday, I don't want that data in my, I don't want that information because that's, you know, golf outings, 144 players take some six and a half hours to play. I don't, that data doesn't do me any good. I want member data and tag helps me put that together. So we get a true feeling of our pace. Yeah, that would, that would skew like a bad day like that would, uh, yeah. Uh, would skew your your numbers quite a bit. Um, Kurt, just to, to jump back a little bit. Uh, so we looked at the technology's impact on the efficiency, but um, you shared some good insights there. Those are great photos, by the way. I really like, uh, um, and really neat cards you have too. Um, just from a, uh, how do you create this excellent play experience? Obviously you put a lot of effort in it, 
Um, you've got great people, great service mindsets and so on. But from a pace and what happens on course point of view, and you mentioned a lot of these points, and that's something that, um, that we obviously try and share as part of our training with the system, but also training around processes, because as you know, uh, Kurt, like a, a process that gets adjusted um, and you continue to improve just a little bit, it adds up so much over time, right? And that's where you, know, you, you turn uh, process into habit and all of a sudden that becomes a completely different result. So, so normally what we try and do is um, for the clubs to communicate expectations and demonstrate competency. So you want to make sure that, uh, that the members know that you've got this covered and, and you've got information and you're in control of it. Uh, but you also want to communicate expectations. So, so I think, I guess, one of the questions we often get asked, and I know that this is a long time ago for you now, uh, but what do the players think about this, you know, when it gets introduced? Uh, because you know, we, we, sometimes we get asked, uh, well, uh, um, do the players complain if they get tracked? Um, and do they feel like Big Brother's watching them? Or do they think, well, it's great that my club is ahead of the game here and, and, and they're paying attention to this. What was that like at, at Wisconsin Club? Uh, your, the Big Brother comment was 100% right at first. Um, and I, I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier or not. We have a TV right behind the golf shop counter with tag up there. So when the members walk in, they kind of get a reminder that, oh, yeah, I'm about to go play golf. And these guys are here are going to be watching me as I go around. So hopefully it reminds them that pace of play is important. Um, but yeah, at first, I think, you know, probably the membership questioned the approach, at least back in 2015, you know, a club starting it today with technology, I, they may be less surprised that that's an approach of golf pro is going to take. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we've used it so long, we have the facts, we have the data that now they, if we didn't have that anymore, I think they would be surprised, you know, how are you going to watch us now? How are you going to make sure pace of play is? You know, so we used to receive phone calls all the time. Hey, the group in front of us is slow. Um, you know, now, hopefully, if we're on, you know, not that it doesn't ever happen, but hopefully, um, you know, we're, we've seen the problem before they have and we've addressed it. The other side of it is when the member does call in and says a group in front of me is slow, with a flick of a button, we can, we can tell uh, them, you know, actually you're, that group is only one minute behind pace, so we'll keep watching them, but now you've given them information right away, otherwise you would have had to drive out there check where they are, look at your watch, look at when they teed off and if they weren't behind, now go back and talk to that group, and now you're able to answer it right away, so um, Those are great points, so I, I think you mentioned earlier um, your starter and the communication by the starter is is quite important, and and I would make sure, I, I would expect that you're setting expectations in terms of this is how we want to play, and uh, and obviously your members know this by now. It's become part of the culture. Um, you mentioned it earlier: manage early and accurately with facts, not opinion. So you got to if somebody falls out of position, you want to catch that early because. On the back nine, it's too late, and now they've impacted five, six, seven, eight groups behind them, and that's when the phone starts ringing. You don't want that to happen. Uh, one of the points uh, that's very important, and uh, you said, well, you, uh, you're very mindful that uh, you want to be supportive and not confrontational. So what, what we've learned is that you never want to say you're slow to a group. If uh, a player says that to another player, they do so at their own risk. <laughs> but you as a manager certainly don't want to do it. So um, one of the ways to work around that is, well, you're a bit out of position, right? Which uh, seems to make sense to players and it doesn't question their, their player IQ, <laughs> um, which is what uh, slow being a slow player somehow seems to relate to. It gets very emotional very quickly. And then last, uh, lastly, track data, measure outcomes, look for improvements. You want to keep getting better. And you mentioned many times that data is key um, to getting those results. And then you just keep doing it over and over and over. And over time, there is just excellence. So, yeah, I just wanted to also congratulate you guys for the work that you're doing and that you co continue to pay attention to it. So in terms of the, the season ahead, uh, you mentioned going back to um to regular riding you mentioned uh, expecting 
you know, the most numbers the club's ever done. Um, are you staffing up a little bit for that to manage the, the wave that's coming or um, how are you tuning into what's ahead? Well, when you said wave, I got a little, I'm a little scared. I won't lie to you. Um, <laughs> oh no, that's a bad, bad wedding. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, I, so we open tomorrow and it's going to be, you know, the high tomorrow is 50. It's going to be 32 degrees at nine o'clock, you know, and it's, I don't know what it's going to be at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, but call it 45. I mean, but we have nearly a hundred people on the tee sheet itching to play and it's walking only because we're not letting carts out this first weekend. So, and then Saturday it's over a hundred. And so, yeah, the wave is coming if this is a sign of what our seasons would be like, but you know, we've, uh, we don't need to hire more people for the course activity um, per se, because you know, again, we have tag. We know where our people are going to be. We we just need more people to run all the events and activities that we run for our members. So, um, I couldn't imagine. You know, if I, I was just kind of thinking about it when you were talking, that if I go back to 2014 when we had you know a person as a marshal, you know, that was that was another body that I had to hire, another body or two that I had to uh, supervise and make sure they were showing up and. You know, I don't have that problem anymore. I, you know, other than any technical issues with Wi-Fi or something like that would, would be about it, which I can't remember the last time that was an issue. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, like you said, our, our system is now on version three. Obviously, it's, it's never finished. We keep improving it. Um, and obviously data teaches us it was really quite a, a ride and in 2015 we were just hanging on to your guys every word because we were good at creating technology but you um you were the experts in managing clubs right so if you tell us this is how you can make it better then we would obviously take that um and 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 look how can we make this part of the system and and five years is a long time in technology um, but now we've come to a point where we are learning from all of these amazing clubs and managers and obviously some do amazing deep dives and what they want out of the system that we can now take this back to everyone else um, and and one of the things that, that you know we can do is a session such as this or a master class or something and it's always a, a exciting to see how willing the community is to share their experience with others and i think that is something uh, derek where obviously that's the platform that you're creating um, and uh, and it's important, uh, yeah, to just look to to add value and, and share and for everyone to be better all the time. 